Most people know the rules of Marco Polo. I doubt anyone reading this who grew up in a neighborhood with a community pool survived their summers without playing this game at least once. One child is selected to be it, closes their eyes and shouts, Marco. All the other kids yell, Polo, and frantically swim away as the child who's it swim towards the last place he or she hears a player respond with Polo. There's always a moment of mild panic mixed with a sense of giddiness for the closest child responding with Polo, as the kid who's it hears them suddenly turns their closed eyes towards their prey and lunges forward in a mad dash to catch them. If the kid who's it successfully catches their victim, that hapless boy or girl becomes the new it. There's one other way the kid who's it can win though. If he or she hears another player leaving the pool, they can call fish out of water and that player becomes the new it. My friends and I played this game all the time when we were little, except that we lived in a more rural area of town on the outskirts of our city suburbs. Instead of going to a crowded neighborhood pool every summer, we had a sizable nearby lake. I remember cutting through my neighbor's backyard toward the wood line each summer, where a small dirt path wound its way downhill for about a quarter of a mile through the trees until I reached an enormous clearing. There, beyond the trees and a small stretch of knee-high grass, sat a large, crystal-clear lake. It seemed enormous to a ten-year-old me at the time, but I don't recall its actual size. All I know is that one of the older boys, Brock, said he swam down to what he thought was probably the deepest part once and told us that it was probably 12 to 15 feet deep. About 30 yards from the shore was a small floating dock which we sometimes sat on and watched small schools of fish dart around shafts of light from the afternoon sun. The fish would occasionally swim up to this dark spot that we could make out at the bottom of the lake which turned out to be the opening of some sort of hole. Brock once bragged to me and some of the other kids that he once swam down to check it out. He never went inside because it would have been a tight squeeze, but he said the water around it was noticeably warmer than the rest of the lake and it seemed to be lined with rock. During the hottest nights of the summer, I and about nine other kids would head down to the lake to play Marco Polo. We'd tell our parents we were going to a nearby field to play flashlight tag and then double back towards the lake once we were out of sight. Once we got there, we'd strip down to our underwear and swim out to that small dock I mentioned. We'd make sure to do this on clear evenings, so the light from the moon was bright enough to make out each other's darkened features. The last time we ever did this, there were exactly 10 of us, counting me. Six boys and four girls, all around the 10 to 12 year old range. Becky, a small freckled awkward girl with eroticism, meaning she had trouble pronouncing the letter R, was picked to be it first. Now when I say she was bad at this game, I mean it. She flailed around helplessly for a good five minutes, maybe longer, repeatedly shouting, Marco. Due to the speech impediment, this sounded more like Mako. We responded with the obligatory polo each time, but as the minutes dragged on, I started to feel more and more sorry for her. Best I could tell from the lighting of the moon and keeping tabs on where everyone was in relation to me, we had all managed to maintain about a good 15-foot gap between her and us. With that in mind, I was surprised when I heard her shout in triumph and announce that she'd caught someone. I didn't spend too much time working it out in my head though, and chalked it up to the dim light as a wispy cloud passed overhead and dimmed the moonlight a bit. Plus, a part of me was relieved she'd actually managed to catch someone. Whoever Becky caught was a much better swimmer than she had been. Such a good swimmer that I decided to risk escaping the safety of the dock, and as quietly as I could, sneaked up onto where I sat and watched the rest of the game unfold. As I sat on the dock, trying to remain as still and quiet as I could, I started to notice that something felt off. There was just enough light at that point that I could see that the person who was now it was a girl, though I wasn't exactly sure who because I couldn't make out any facial features in that light. She also sounded a lot like Becky. She pronounced her R's the same way, so when she'd call out Marco, it sounded like Mako. Something else was off about the voice though, and it took me a minute before I realized what it was. It was a couple of things. Her voice was completely monotone, 
and it almost had a robotic quality to it. By that, I mean, besides the monotone way she spoke, she emphasized the wrong syllable. So it sounded like, Mako. She also never paused to allow anyone to respond. It was just, Mako, 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 over and over again. This was odd, yes, but it made me more curious to know which one of our group it was. It sounded remarkably like Becky, but I knew it wasn't her, as she was frantically swimming away at that point. I decided to figure out by process of elimination. I was the only one on the dock, so I had a better view than anyone else. With ten of us in total, I began my count. It took me a couple of tries due to the low light and the fact that I was convinced I miscounted. I began to panic, though, as I realized that there were ten people in the water, not nine like there should have been. I quickly shouted to everyone to get out of the water. There was a moment of confused hesitation, but some of the others must have also sensed something was off, because after that pause, everyone swam for the dock as fast as they could. One by one, everyone clambered onto the dock and huddled together. Everyone, except Becky, that is. She was still trying to swim away from that weird girl as fast as she could while crying for help. Brock and I almost dove back in after her, but it was too late. The girl who was it, suddenly, in an inhumanly fast motion, surged forward while at the same time rising in the water vertically into the air. For a split second, the image of her doing that reminded me of one of those mermaid figureheads at the bow of an old sailing ship. For one horrifying moment, the girl, or whatever it was, was high enough out of the water that we would have been able to see her legs, if she had legs, that is. Instead of legs, after her waist came a pinnacle of what looked like slippery flesh. It reminded me a lot of a hand puppet where you can see a little bit of the puppeteer's arm. In one fluid movement, the girl thing fell on Becky, grabbed her in a tight embrace, and pulled her under the water. Where she had once been, there was nothing more than a ripple and a small vortex-like swirl. The wispy clouds suddenly cleared, and in the moonlight, I could see this abominable tentacle puppet thing retract into the hole at the bottom of the lake. It got stuck for a moment as it tried to force Becky into the hole with it, but it managed to do so, and then she completely disappeared into it in a dark cloud of what was probably blood, sediment, and air bubbles. As if a spell had been broken, everyone suddenly dove into the water towards the shore, screaming and splashing in panic, where we were met at the shore by some of the angry parents who had been woken by all the commotion. While none of our parents ever believed our story about the puppet thing that had mimicked Becky and dragged her under, a subsequent search by police divers revealed the hole and, just inside it, the tattered remains of the unfortunate girl's swimsuit top. It was too tight a squeeze for the divers to get into, so nothing else was ever found. They simply covered up the hole as best they could, erected a chain-link fence blocking off that section of shoreline, and put up a sign warning people away from swimming in the lake. I don't think that hole remained covered for very long, though. A few months after Becky disappeared, I snuck out of my house one final time, to sit a safe distance back from the shoreline, watch the sunset, and say a final symbolic goodbye to Becky. I'd been seeing a therapist for all the good it did at the time, and I thought making this gesture might help bring some sort of closure, even if it didn't stop the frequent nightmares and panic attacks. As I watched the sunset over the lake, my eyes caught a ripple in the water. A moment later, this was followed by the puppet-like silhouette of whatever that creature had been cutting through the water like a mermaid figurehead at the bow of an old ship in a lazy figure eight motion. A voice emanating from it poorly, mimicking Becky's in a never ending monotone. Mako, Mako, Mako. There was another noise in the background that gradually seemed to become louder and louder until a full minute later, I realized it was me screaming and sobbing hysterically. With that, I turned and ran.